Hi there, and welcome to another episode of Seller Notes. I'm your host, Matt Getch, and today I have with me our guest is Bob Stashak, the winemaker for Bronco Wine Company. Welcome to the show, Bob. Hi, Matt. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for coming. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. You know, I was very lucky. Uh, I was going to Healdsburg High School in Sonoma County and befriended the Segacio family, famous winemaking family from, uh, from Healdsburg. Excellent. And they're the ones that actually it. got me, yeah, they're the ones that actually got me interested in winemaking. So I went to UC Davis. I uh, graduated in 1973 with a degree in fermentation science and uh, got a job at Corbell Champagne Cellars. Worked there for 19 years learning to make bubbles and then consulted for four years after that and Bronco Wine Company was looking for somebody to make sparkling wine for them and so they hired me as a consultant to start with and now 19 years later I've been making sparkling wine for, for Bronco Wine Company. So Bronco Wine Company brings to mind some interesting imagery but that's not really the way it's supposed to go. Where did Bronco actually come from, the name? Well of course people think of a bucking Bronco, right? But it's actually a contraction or an acronym for the owners, Brothers and Cousins. Bronco. Brothers and Cousins. Yeah. And how many people are actually, how many Franzias are working for the company? Well you've got the three owners and they have 13 children and there's 11 of those children that are actively working in the winery. Th 11 out of 13 are all working in the winery. Exactly. So it's a it, true family owned thing. And yeah. It's a giant national label. I think it's fourth in the U.S., third or fourth? Well yeah, the, the winery itself is the fourth largest winery in, in the world, right? But you don't, uh, you don't see a Bronco out there. We don't have a Bronco brand, for instance. We got 60 other brands but we don't have a Bronco brand. So when you say Bronco Wine Company, people say, well, you know. Yeah, who is that? that? Who do you work yeah. for? You say Crane Lake, you say oh, Forest yeah, Glen, sure. you say Forestville, then they say, oh yeah, I know those wines. All right, excellent. Yeah. And they have just millions and millions of gallons going out of that facility. You can't yeah. do that all yourself, do you? Well, you know, it's, it's an interesting story because the, the, the Franzi family that owns Bronco Wine Company, not to be associated with the, the bag in the box wines, right. uh, they started out in what we call the, the bulk wine business in the, in the 1970s. They had sold their winery and their brand to Coca-Cola Bottling of New York and so they started out new created Bronco Wine Company. What they were doing was making wine for other wines to use in their programs. We call that the, the, the bulk wine uh, industry. And so that was very, very successful and they decided, well, why should we be making um, wine from other people's grapes to sell to other wineries? So they started to acquire vineyards to the tune of 40,000 acres of wine grapes today. And then along the way, we're talking maybe the late 1980s, early 1990s, um, recession. Some uh, wineries went belly up and we acquired brands. We acquired brands like, like Hacienda and, and Forestville because we decided, well, if we're making wine from our grapes and selling it to the wineries, why should we put, be putting those fine grapes in our own programs? And so that kicked off to very strongly. Forest Glen was one of our biggest brands during the, the 1990s and now we've got like 60 brands that, that were, were uh, uh, making wine for. You deal majorly in uh, sparkling wine, did I hear that right? I mean you do some still wines as well, but you do a lot of the sparkling wines for yeah, the company? Yes, I do. In fact, I'm the director of all sparkling wine production at, uh, at Bronco Wine Company, which includes um, Charmant Process, uh, Methyl Champenoise, and Carbonated. Excellent. Carbonated Let's wines. get into those things for a little sure. bit because mm -hmm. I know a lot of people that watch this are really curious about you know how the bubbles get into the bottle. Okay. I think a lot of people think that the infusion method is mm -hmm like the industry standard, which isn't even close. The infusion method is just for like your, your bottom shelf stuff, because that stuff tends to go flat real quick, doesn't it? Yes, and uh, the um, products that are naturally fermented are the ones that have the, the smallest bubbles and have the, uh, the, the pedigrees, if you want to call it that. That includes the bottle fermented uh, products that, um, that we make uh, and the Charmat process that, that we make as well. Bottle fermentation is just real simple if you want to get into that real quick. Yes, please. Is where, yeah, we actually take what we call a cuvee wine, which is the wine that's been selected to become a sparkling wine. We add sugar back to that wine, we add yeast back to that wine, we put it in a bottle, put a closure on that bottle, and fermentation takes place in the bottle to create the bubbles. Then there's also an extended aging period on, on the yeast and, and it's called autolysis, just to throw out a fancy word. But what happens is the yeast disintegrate in that bottle and that's what what's produces that really unique yeasty character that you get in bottle fermented products. And then you have to go through the riddling process where you shake all the yeast into the neck of the bottle. Then you go through the disgorging process where you actually freeze the neck of the bottle and you pop that crown cap which has been the seal for that bottle and it, that ejects 
that uh, plug of, of yeast in, in frozen wine, leaving a clear bottle of, of, of sparkling wine. Oh, good. That was definitely going to be a question of mine, is how, once they get all the yeast and sugar in there, how do you get it back out again? Because you notice you don't see a lot of it floating around in these bottles. E exactly. And so with the, uh, the method champenoise process, where you're actually fermenting in the bottle, you have to go through that riddling and that disgorging process to remove all that yeast. Turn it upside down, That's right. twist it a little bit, and all that stuff All that stuff back down goes back into the neck of the bottle. Right. That's right. And then you freeze it, mm -hmm. and then that comes out, but the wine doesn't? Yeah, that's exactly right. Because what you do is you also chill the wine real cold before you go through this disgorging process, so you lose very little CO2. But there's just enough natural pressure in the headspace of that bottle that when you pop that crown cap, that ice plug of, of yeast just flies right out. Oh, how cool. Yeah, it's a really neat process. And the Charmat method you were okay. mentioning earlier, that's different than the method champagne wine, that right? Is, that is correct. So we're going to start with our cuvee wine again. We're going to add the sugar. We're going to add the yeast. But instead of going into the bottle, we're going to go into a stainless steel pressurized tank. So now the fermentation takes place in the tank. For Giant version of the method champagne wine. Yeah, uh, just to give you just an idea. to visualize like a humongous, but instead of just doing a bottle at a time, mm -hmm. you just do one humongous bottle and then put them into individual bottles. Yeah, that humongous bottle is about 24,000 gallons. Oh my God. Yeah. Okay. And uh, how do you get the, uh, the wine back out of the tank without it uh, fizzing all over the place? This is where it gets really, really complicated. And to, and to this uh, end, I, this is why I believe method champenoise is so much simpler because any time you move a pressurized or carbonated uh, beverage through uh, equipment, you stand the chance of losing carbon dioxide. So everything has to be pressurized. So the, the, the hoses have to be, you know, uh, built to withstand, you know, 90 PSI pressure. Uh, the filters, the, the centrifuges, and of course all the, the filling equipment is, uh, as well. So whenever you handle this sparkling wine during the Charmat process, everything is under pressure to keep the carbon dioxide in solution. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you this, with the, uh, we, you know, some of us have a basic understanding of fermentation, mm -hmm. and you put the, the yeast eats the sugar, and then mm -hmm. it turns into uh, alcohol, and the, one of the byproducts is the carbon dioxide, which makes the bubbles. I understand that. Mm -hmm. So you start out with a wine, the cuvee. Mm -hmm. It's already a wine, correct? Mm -hmm. It's not just that grape is, juice? That's right. That's it's right. already fermented. It's mm -hmm. got some alcohol in there. Mm -hmm. And then you throw the sugar and the yeast back in there. Mm -hmm. Why aren't champagnes twice the alcohol of normal wine? Excellent uh, question, Matt, because the amount of sugar that we're adding during the secondary fermentation process is much less than what's in there initially. So when you harvest grapes uh, for making sparkling wine, the uh, percentage of sugar is about 18 to 20 percent, okay? And that will translate into about 10 to 10 and a half percent alcohol. Now, once you've made that cuvee wine, you've cleaned it up and it's ready to make into sparkling wine, you only add um, about two and a half percent sugar back. Okay, so that's going to make another one, one and a half percent alcohol. Add that to your original tin, and you're up around 11 and a half, 12. Okay. So that's that's it takes that, that's far less fermentation to get the carbon dioxide in there than it does to actually initially get the alcohol in it. Exactly. And during the the primary fermentation, we just let that CO2 go out into the atmosphere. Okay. But during the secondary fermentation, then we trap that CO2. And then sometimes we end up with, uh, I know one of your new products is a mango flavored uh, allure. Oh, uh, yes, yes. So sometimes we end up adding fruit juices other than grape juice. Is that it, how you got that it, flavor? Exactly. And, uh, you know, honestly, the uh, allure program, we went with the infusion with the carbonation on that particular program because we did not want the yeasty character that you get from secondary fermentation. Instead, we wanted to really accent the, uh, the character of the fruit flavors that we're adding to the wines. So the allure uh, program. Uh, including the peach and, and, the, and the mango, and even the irregular, the um, uh, allure and the pink moscato, uh, all are made through um, infusion, mm -hmm. or what we call we call it just uh, artificial carbonation. I've heard uh, a number of different methods to, to open, and everybody loves that huge popping noise mm -hmm. that you hear, you know, when they're opening champagne for a celebration at a wedding yeah. or whatever. Uh, but from every winemaker that's ever put a cork into a bottle mm -hmm. has told me that it shouldn't pop, it should just hiss. That is correct. And so the way you open it is uh, if you, first of all, it should be chilled. I mean, that's going to help it not to, to, to pop, right? So it should be really cold. And then what you do is you twist the bottle as you hold the cork and hold it as an, at an angle. If you have the bottle straight up, you've got very, very little surface area of the, uh, the bubbles to come out because you will get some, some bubbles that, that jump out of solution when the, when the cork is removed and you tend to, to, to push liquid out as well. If you tilt the bottle at an angle, you open up the surface area just a little bit more. It allows that gas to escape during the initial removal of the cork without popping tough so much and also without losing any of the, the precious liquid as well. Yeah, that's an unfortunate byproduct of the excellent popping noises that you usually see that in the movies too. When they go, 
and yeah. it goes flying everywhere, and then all of a sudden the wine's everywhere and you lose half your wine. <laughs> exactly. That's the point. <laughs> and they put cages on a lot of these bottles now, and that's t just to keep the, uh, the cork from yeah. releasing yeah. itself? We call it a cage or a wire hood, and, and basically what that is is just the device that holds that cork in the bottle. Okay, so yeah. it's just to keep, just to make sure. It's mm -hmm. not going to go popping off on its own for the most part. It will. Actually, it will. If, oh, well. if, uh, yeah, it will, because there's also a lubricant that's put on that cork, a silicone and, and, and paraffin, to help in the extraction of the cork. Because if you didn't, didn't have that out. on there, it would be very hard to, to, to take the cork out. But the chances are, without the wire hood and under certain some, uh, conditions, maybe if the bottle was rocked or if it was overly warm, that cork would come flying out. So uh, should we talk a little bit about the uh, individual wines that you brought here today? Sure. What, what I have is, um, I'm going to start with the, uh, the driest one, one of our newest um, additions, and that is the, um, the Blanc de Blue. And what I like about this product is we decided to make a flavored wine, but make it with a lot of pedigree as well, okay? And what we did to accomplish that is we used a, a, a Chardonnay as the base wine for the Cuvée wine, and then we went through the, um, the Charmat process, so it's now a natural fermentation. So it's not infused, it's not carbonated, and we can call it sparkling wine. The, uh, the fine points are, if you see uh, the terminology sparkling wine used on a bottle, it has to be natural fermentation. It can't be carbonated. Oh. So, so we've gone through all that processing. We've added a blueberry essence to this wine. And uh, the other nice thing about this is, um, you see the, uh, the beautiful color? Uh, you could not get that in a bottle manufactured in the United States. The reason being is that there's a mandate to use recycled glass whenever you make glass. Well, even if you're making a, a clear uh, tank of, of, um, of clear glass, uh, you have to add what is called cullet back or the recycled glass. And if you get a little green glass mixed in there, you get a little brown glass in there, it tends to dull the, 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 the color. And so we put the, the Blanc de Blue in that glass and realized that it made the color look kind of gray-green. It kind of washed it out. So we have to actually import glass from countries where you don't have to have the, the color to recycle glass to get that real pure color. Uh, so tell me a little bit about JFJ wines. I know a few years ago somebody came up to me and asked me for an almond-flavored sparkling wine, and I had never heard of such a thing. Okay. First thing I came upon was JFJ. Wonderful, because JFJ is also one of our oldest brands. JFJ standing for Joseph, Fred, and John. They're the three owners of Bronco Wine Company. The are they all, are they all they're brothers? All they're all friends, yes. All Franzia brothers. Yes, okay. That's right, yeah. Well, actually, two brothers. Joseph and Fred are brothers. Okay. And then uh, John is a cousin. Oh, okay. But they're all friends. they're all friends. They're all equal owners of, of Bronco Wine Company. The JFJ brand was one of the first brands they introduced, and they introduced that back in the late 1970s. So uh, the JFJ brand has been around a long time. But we had a brainstorm back in the early uh, 2000s uh, to, to do something a little bit different. And that's when we created the almond flavored. And uh, almond flavored has been in sparkling wines in, in the past. It's, it's not thing novel, but uh, never really got legs, so to speak. So we decided, well, why not do something a little bit fun, a little bit traditional, and make our own almond flavored sparkling one under the JFJ brand. Sure, excellent. Yeah. And you've got one more brand that you brought with me that I'm not 100% familiar with. It's kind of mm. new to me. It's called gravel bar? Yeah, it's very, very new. This is a, a fun program because we are so entrenched in California viticulture, the Franzia family with 40 plus thousand acres of grapes. It was really nice that uh, Joey Franzia, who is the son of one of the owners, says, Stashak, I want to do something different. I want to go outside of California with a, with a brand. So we started to explore different wineries uh, in, in Washington and came up with the, the gravel bar program. The gravel bar name is kind of neat because uh, if we've got a little time for a little history, a little uh, geology, oh, uh, back uh, yeah, 20,000 years ago, Little Lake Missoula in uh, Montana was Glacial Lake Missoula, the size of uh, Lake Erie and, and Huron combined. And why it's called a glacial lake is the, the, the um, valley was dammed up on one side by a glacier. Well, what happened is it did. It broke all at once. And so that lake emptied in a matter of days. It if you can imagine that into the much whole water. It took uh, granite rocks that are native to Montana and moved them ton, uh, rocks that weighed tons into this Washington River Valley, the Columbia River Valley. And so literally when they start to, to plant a vineyard and they start to dig the tine through to, to, to break up the soil, they will dig up some of these, these rocks that are native to Montana in the state of Washington. Well, the gravel also washed up the sides of the mountains from this tremendous flood. 
And so we got this gravel bar along the sides of the Columbia River Valley, and then we came up with the name Gravel Bar. It gives me, as a winemaker, an opportunity to, to explore some, some new winemaking techniques, some new blending techniques, some new flavor styles. It's been a, a great experience for me. So we came out with the first uh, uh, group of these in uh, 2014 from the 2013 vintage. Excellent. Well, I yeah. could talk your ear off all day, Bob, but we got to get going. I very much appreciate you coming Thank to join you, us and sharing all it's your knowledge. It's been fun. My pleasure. And we'll see you next time on Seller Notes.